This is Big Ideas from the ABC. Geoengineering. All animal species, except for humans, have adapted themselves to their environment. Humans are the only species who have adapted our environment to suit ourselves. When we do this, is it a quest simply to um, make a habitable environment for ourselves, to make ourselves more comfortable? Well, you know, when we get hot, we can just turn on the air conditioning. When we get cold, we can turn on the heater. We can pipe water into our homes if we get thirsty. But the trouble is that our quest for transforming environments for ourselves have inadvertently transformed the environments for the rest of the species on the planet as well. We all know about climate change. We all know how fossil fuels affect our environment, how the energy that we use in our day-to-day -day life is changing the very fabric of our skies. Since humans developed agriculture, that was around about 10,000 years ago. And coinciding with that, not because of it, but coinciding with that, we've had 10,000 years of incredibly stable temperature. It's quite bizarre when you look at the history of climate change through millennia. In the last 10,000 years, it really hasn't varied more than half a degree hotter or colder. In the last 250 years, our temperature has increased 0.8 of a degree, so that's nearly a whole degree. This is unprecedented in the last 10,000 years since humans became civilised. So now we're talk once centred on perhaps keeping temperatures below two degrees increase. We're now seriously looking at four degrees. Some people are even saying six degrees. We've never experienced this as humans in our entire existence. So what this could do to our agriculture, to our environment, to our civilizations, or in fact to the rest of the species on the planet, remember we're not alone on this earth, is simply unknown. We just don't know how it's gonna pan out. So we need to prepare for a climate change future. We need to possibly mitigate the environmental impact that we're having on the climate. So it'd be good if we could all reduce our fossil fuel use somehow. It would be good also if we could adapt for the future. So we know that sea levels are gonna rise, so we get organized for that. And we move our houses or we change our infrastructure, so on and so forth. Adaptation is an area of research that is currently being seriously undertaken. And then there's a third option geoengineering. And that basically is to change the Earth's planet back to how it was. We can do this by stopping fossil fuel use, of course, but it'll take a little while for that to kick in because most of the gases, the greenhouse gases, have a long lifetime in the atmosphere. But geoengineering, there's a whole world of possibilities there that we could actually make this change sooner and faster. But is it a good idea? There's a possibility that some of these things are completely untried, it might go terribly, terribly wrong, and then we're left in an even worse situation than we were before when we tried to change the environment the first time around. So geoengineering is a frightening concept. It conjures up these images of, of planes dumping loads of chemicals into the sky or of giant floating mirrors in space, this sort of thing. But it's simple things as well. Planting more trees is in fact geoengineering because we're trying to change, deliberately change the climate for better. Painting roofs white is an idea that Stephen Chu, the, uh, the what is the energy secretary for the United States, or he's just left. Uh, he suggested that we all paint our roofs white to increase the albedo of the planet, reflect more sunlight out into space. This is still geoengineering, but it's a little bit less scary than, say, flying a plane into halfway into space and then dumping a load of sulfur. So we have already geoengineered the planet. So the question now is whether or not we should geoengineer the planet back or more or just try and fix things a different way. We have this tool available to us. It's one of the tools in our kit. Should we use it? Should we not? This is something we're going to look at today. And we have two esteemed speakers. We have Clive Hamilton and Peter Singer. And we're going to hear from Clive first. He's going to tell us all about his new book, for starters, but also um, the different kinds of geoengineering there is and whether or not we should potentially use this. Clive Hamilton is a professor of public ethics at Charles Sturt University in Canberra. He was the founder and for 14 years the executive director of the Australia Institute, a public think tank. He's held visiting academic positions at Yale and at Oxford and is the author of a number of influential books, including Growth Fetish and Requiem for a Species. His latest book on geoengineering 
earth masters playing God with the climate was described by none less than Naomi Klein as a dazzling multi-layered exploration of the strange and terrifying world of geoengineering. Everyone, please make Clive welcome. Thanks, Sarah, for that introduction and to the Sustainable Living Festival for uh, putting on this event today. Well, climate scientists have watched with uh, mounting alarm as carbon dioxide concentrations have increased relentlessly. And the an anxiety has deepened each year as it has become clearer um, that the range of emission paths mapped out by the experts in the 1990s and early 2000s were unduly optimistic. The actual growth path in emissions, uh, boosted by explosive growth in China, has described a pathway that is worse than the worst case scenario. Alarm has spread to state organisations like the International Energy Agency. Uh, in 2011, it declared on planned policies, rising fossil energy use will lead to irreversible and potentially catastrophic climate change. And late last year, the World Bank warned that we are on track for a four degree C warmer world marked by extreme heat waves, declining food stocks, loss of ecosystems and biodiversity, and life-threatening sea level rise. Now, it's hard to communicate to the public what a world warmed by four degrees centigrade will be like, or even that the IEA and the World Bank should be taken seriously. After all, for many people, one unseasonable snowstorm is enough to nullify decades of painstaking scientific study. And psychologists have discovered that, after accounting for all other factors, when people are put in a room and asked about climate change, they are significantly more likely to agree that, the, that global warming is a proven fact if the thermostat is turned up. Turned up. So for at least a decade, climate scientists have been disturbed by the widening gap between the actions demanded by the evidence and those being implemented or even considered by the major polluting nations. At the same time, their work began to focus on the dangers of feedback effects in the climate system, that is, processes that amplify or dampen the direct warming effect of rising greenhouse gases. For example, as warming melts the Arctic ice cap, the exposed water is darker than the highly reflective ice that it replaces, and so it absorbs more heat from the sun. Many in the expert community received a fright from the dramatic declines in Arctic summer sea ice in 2005 and 2007, and the melting of sea ice this past northern summer set new records. The study of feedback effects has been closely related to another idea emerging in the scientific literature, that of tipping points. Small changes in one element of the climate system may initially have only small effects, but at some point a threshold may be crossed where the system, driven by amplifying feedbacks, flips into a new state. Paleoclimatologists have discovered many instances in the Earth's geological record of the climate shifting abruptly from one state to another. The esteemed paleoclimatologist Wally Brocker has warned, the paleoclimate record shouts at, to us that far from being self-stabilising, the Earth's climate system is an ornery beast which overreacts even to small nudges. Against this background, climate scientists began to talk about possible responses to a climate emergency, such as a massive methane release with rapid melting of the permafrost, the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet, or rapid dieback of Amazon forests. Any of these would quickly shift the global climate to a new state, and there would be no way of recovering the situation. How, they asked, could we intervene to prevent this happening? If plan A, persuading the world to cut emissions is failing, shouldn't we have a plan B? And so in the last few years, research into various schemes to engineer the climate has been accelerating. Geoengineering may be defined 
as the deliberate large-scale intervention in the climate system designed to counter global warming or offset some of its effects. More than 40 schemes have been put forward, with some the subject of intensive research. They're usually divided into two types. Methods to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, such as by capturing it from the air, making biochar, and adding lime to the oceans. And solar radiation management technologies aimed at increasing the Earth's reflectivity, or albedo. And methods of solar radiation management include painting roofs white, uh, putting mirrors in space, and brightening marine clouds to reflect more sunlight back out to space. But let me describe very briefly the two leading methods, ocean iron fertilisation and sulphate aerosol spraying. When we dig up and burn fossil fuels, we make use of its, their trapped energy. But the carbon atoms in the fossil fuels do not disappear. So where do they go? First, they go into the atmosphere. Some is then soaked up by vegetation. Some, sooner or later, ends up in the various layers of the oceans. The deep ocean has the capacity to absorb large amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And it would help if we could get more carbon down there and hope that it stays in the ocean depths. But how do we get carbon to the deep ocean? The answer lies in what is known as the biological pump. Tiny marine plants known as phytoplankton grow by combining carbon dioxide, various minerals, and sunlight to multiply into blooms. On death, gravity causes the plankton to sink, taking their carbon to the ocean depths. The effectiveness of the biological pump depends on the suitability of conditions for marine life including the availability of micronutrients, especially iron. If a shortage of iron is limiting plankton growth in an area of ocean, then perhaps the artificial addition of the missing ingredient can stimulate algal blooms. Fertilising some areas of ocean with iron slurry does indeed promote algal blooms. But it turns out that much of the carbon fixed in the phytoplankton does not find its way to the ocean floor, but circulates in the surface waters, feeding the food chain before uh, being emitted as carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. And while iron fertilisation stimulates biological productivity in one area of ocean, so-called nutrient stealing can see it fall in others. As one expert said, you might make some of the ocean greener by iron enrichment, but you're going to make a lot of the ocean bluer. It's been estimated that a massive fertilisation effort over 100 years could absorb uh, perhaps 3% of cumulative carbon emissions from burning fossil fuels over the same period. In the meantime, ocean acidification and temperatures would reach um, a level at which algal populations would be severely reduced. And this is one reason why climate engineering without emission cuts would be disastrous. But the form of geoengineering most likely to be, to be deployed is known as sulphate aerosol spraying. The proposal is to spray sulphur dioxide or sulphuric acid into the upper atmosphere to form tiny particles that would reflect an extra one or two percent of incoming solar radiation back into space, thereby cooling the planet. The aim would be to mimic the effects of volcanoes. The particles spewed into the atmosphere by large eruptions have been known to cool the planet by a de degree or so for a year or two and to change the colour of the sky. In 1883, the spectacular sunsets in Oslo after the eruption of Mount Krakatoa off the coast of Indonesia inspired Edvard Munch to paint the scream. The most likely delivery method for sulphate aerosol spraying is a fleet of customised high-flying aircraft fitted with tanks and spraying equipment, although a hose suspended in the sky is also being investigated. <coughs> 
In effect, humans would be installing a radiative shield between the Earth and the Sun, one that could be adjusted by those who control it to regulate the temperature of the planet. How effective would such a solar filter be in suppressing warming? All of the models indicate that if we reduce the amount of sunlight reaching the planet, the Earth would indeed cool fairly quickly and fairly evenly, although less so towards the poles. The models also show that rainfall will be re return somewhere at least towards pre-warming patterns. But crucially, the solar shield would do nothing to offset the acidification of the oceans due to carbon emissions. However, other atmospheric scientists argue that the complexity of the climate system means that it's simply impossible to draw any firm conclusions about the consequences of such a radical intervention in the Earth's system. They point out, for example, that the chemistry of the atmosphere is complicated. So turning down the amount of sunlight reaching the Earth in a model can give little clue as to what would happen in the actual climate system. One important question is how the extra sulphur compounds put into the uh, stratosphere would interact with the ozone layer. The most comprehensive study concluded that ejecting, injecting enough sulphur to suppress the warming associated with a doubling of carbon dioxide would indeed deplete ozone in polar regions, delaying the recovery of the ozone, uh, um, sorry, the, yeah, the Antarctic ozone hole, delaying the recovery of the Antarctic ozone hole by 30 to 70 years. Other studies indicate that the Indian monsoon would be seriously disrupted, affecting food supplies potentially for up to 2 billion people, although the disruption may be less than in a scenario of warming without the solar filter. Even so, our understanding of what influences the monsoon is weak, our knowledge of how global warming would change the monsoon is weaker, and trying to estimate the combined influences of warming and solar radiation management is little more than educated guesswork. Who knows what would happen to rainfall patterns? But if catastrophe ensued after sulphate spraying, at least we would know whom to blame. Or would we? And here we get to one of the strongest objections to sulphate aerosol spraying. We cannot know how it would affect the global climate system through modelling or even by conducting experiments. Only by full-scale implementation could we get a clear idea of its impacts. And so, and even then, if we did implement it on the full scale, we would need at least 10 years of global climate data before we had enough information to separate out the effects of sulphate aerosol spraying from natural climate variability and indeed from the effects of human-induced climate change. The levels of omniscience and, and omnipotence required to make it work really would have us playing God. To compound the risks, if after 10 years, when we accumulated enough data to decide that our intervention was not a good idea, it may be impossible to terminate the solar shield. Why should this be, sh be so? Well, for some time, ecologists have known that the rate at which the globe warms is a greater threat to ecosystems than the amount of warming, because a slower rate of warming gives plant and animal communities more time to adapt. It's estimated that if warming occurs at a rate of 0.1 degrees centigrade per decade, half of ecosystems will have time to adapt, and of course the other half won't. At a warming rate of 0.3%, sorry, 0.3 degrees per decade, only 30%, less than a third of ecosystems can adapt. Now, according to one study, if sulphate aerosol spraying began in 2020, and for one reason or another had to be stopped 40 years later, we would see a surge in average temperature by a scorching 1.3 degrees in the first decade, falling back in the following decades. Few ecosystems could survive the first decade of rapid heating after the solar shield had been turned off. So once deployed, it's likely we would become dependent on our solar filter, 
the more so if we failed to take the opportunity while it was in place to cut greenhouse gas emissions sharply. This is perhaps the solar filter's most dangerous drawback. A constituency advocating investment in major research programs has now emerged and is gaining influence. At the centre of this network is a pair of North American scientists actively engaged in geoengineering research, David Keith, a Harvard physicist, and Ken Caldera, an atmospheric scientist based at Stanford University. For some years, they have been Bill Gates's principal source of expert knowledge on climate change. Gates was persuaded to commit several million dollars to finance research into geoengineering. Incidentally, Richard Branson is also promoting geoengineering as a response to climate change. Bill Gates is now the world's leading financial supporter of geoengineering research. He's an investor in various geoengineering enterprises, including one called Silver Lining, a company pursuing marine cloud brightening methods. He's an investor in a company called Carbon Engineering Limited, a startup company formed by David Keith to develop technology to capture carbon dioxide from the ambient air on an industrial scale. Gates is also an investor in a firm known as Intellectual Ventures, led by Nathan Mervold, formerly Chief Technology Officer at Microsoft. The company has developed what it calls its uh, Stratoshield, a hose suspended by balloons in the sky to deliver sulphate aerosols. The device is marketed as a practical, low-cost way to reverse catastrophic warming of the Arctic or the entire planet. In recent years, there's been a flurry of patents taken out over methods to engineer the climate. One of them is so broad that, if enforceable, it would place fertilisation of the oceans in the hands of one man. We're approaching a situation in which international efforts to protect humanity from climate catastrophe could depend on whether or not one company wants to sell its intellectual property. Oil companies, anticipating a shift in the political landscape, are quietly backing research into geoengineering. Royal Dutch Shell is funding study of liming the seas. The chief scientist at the oil giant BP was the convener of an expert meeting that in 2009 produced an influential report on climate engineering as a response to climate emergencies. ExxonMobil, for years the principal funder of climate science dis disinformation, has inserted itself into climate engineering. The corporation's point man on geoengineering um, is Haroon Keshki, who leads its global climate change program. In 1995, Keshki was the first to propose liming the oceans as a means of reducing acidification due to escalating atmospheric carbon. Through Keshki, Exxon has begun to influence various independent reports into geoengineering, including one by NASA in 2007. Burgeoning commercial engagement in geoengineering is creating a lobby with an interest in more research and, eventually, deployment. Such a lobby is naturally predisposed to argue that pursuing emission cuts is unrealistic or politically impossible, and therefore geoengineering is the sensible alternative. This is the slippery slope concern about researching geoengineering. Already, a chorus of demands for public funding is loud and governments are beginning to show interest. China recently decided to include geoengineering among its earth science research priorities, initiating a marked shift in the international climate change landscape. It's fair to expect that if we reach the stage of deployment of the solar shield, for instance, any move to terminate it due, for example, to evidence of unexpected environmental damage or international conflict over geoengineering, any scheme to terminate would be, or plan to terminate, would be fought by the new industry with complaints of asset devaluation and job losses. Today, it may seem absurd that factors like these should play a role in deciding the fate of the entire planet. 
but the history of environmental policy making shows that these kinds of decisions are never based solely on scientific considerations. All of which points to perhaps the greatest risk of research into geoengineering. It will erode the incentive to cut emissions, the so-called moral hazard argument. In a political and commercial environment where cutting emissions appears too hard, geoengineering arrives as the next great white hope. Already in the United States, right-wing think tanks like the American Enterprise Institute, which have for years promoted uh, denial of climate science, are now advocating geoengineering as a substitute for cutting emissions. Economists like the authors of Super Freakonomics have joined in. Which government would not be enticed by the techno fix to beat all techno fixes? Think about it. No need to take on powerful fossil fuel companies. No need to tax petrol and electricity. No need to ask consumers to change their lifestyles. And instead of global warming being proof of human failure, geoengineering could be the triumph of human ingenuity. In short, while climate change threatens to destabilise the system, geoengineering promises to protect it. Yet beneath it all lies a gnawing question. What kind of beings have we become when we believe we can use technology to take control of the climate system of the planet as a whole and regulate it to suit our needs for thousands of years to come? Thank you. Thank you, Clive. Peter Singer is a professor of bioethics at the University Centre for Human Values at Princeton University and laureate professor at the School for Historical and Philosophical Studies at the University of Melbourne. He has been called both the most influential living philosopher and the most dangerous man in the world. He is best known for his applied ethics and controversial perspective on abortion, animal liberation and infanticide. Singer is a strong proponent of eliminating poverty, arguing that anyone who has more than they need should be giving to those in need. Please make Peter Singer welcome. Thank you very much. It's good to be back at the Sustainable Living Festival. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be talking about this interesting topic, which Clive Hamilton has raised in his uh, book, Earth Masters, uh, which has the same subtitle as our session, Playing God with the Climate. And before I get into the, the topic, I do want to say that I think this is a pretty silly subtitle uh, or title for this session. Uh, the objection to playing God, which is of course not new about climate, it's been around in uh, bioethics, for example, for a long time. The idea that if we make decisions about whether to treat some patients rather than other patients with the result that the patients we don't treat may die, uh, that, it, that we are playing God and that this is a bad thing to do. And whenever I hear that phrase, I feel the, the implication that this is a bad thing to do, that we should not play God. Well, playing God would be a bad thing to do if A, there were a God, and B, this God was going to take care of things. So we don't need to play God. We don't need to take over God's role. But I don't believe in the first of those assumptions, that there is a God, I know many other people do, but those who do, um, and I actually have no idea what Clive's beliefs are, are on this, um, I presume most of them anyway do not think that God is going to take care of the problem of climate change for us. And I know Clive certainly doesn't think that, otherwise he wouldn't be so passionately writing and talking about how we need to do something. So. Um, I think the, the assumptions for thinking that uh, we ought not to do things 
which are going to affect the, what happens to our planet in future, that we are in some way usurping a role that doesn't belong to us or that we are taking too much power is a misleading assumption. It implies, in the absence of a God who is going to look after things, it implies that somehow it would be better if we let nature take its course. And that's another phrase that often you hear when you do bioethics, uh, that uh, it's okay for doctors to let nature take its course, to allow someone to die without treating them, but uh, heaven forbid that they should heed their requests for voluntary active euthanasia and actually give them an injection that will end their suffering. Uh, that seems to me to be another gratuitous distinction. So um, I think we need to get away from this. I think we need to accept the fact that we have got ourselves into a horrendous mess by our greenhouse gas emissions, the, one, the emissions that we're causing. Um, we did this for a long time without actually understanding that we were doing it, but at least for the last um, 20 years, at the very minimum since the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, we have known full well what we are doing. All of the nations of the world basically signed on to a statement then that we should prevent dangerous anthropogenic climate change, and we have lamentably failed to live up to that commitment. We have not prevented it. On the contrary, we've continued to emit greenhouse gases that mean that now it's virtually certain to occur. If we define dangerous anthropogenic climate change as uh, more than two degrees Celsius uh, warning, uh, many scientists think we're already past that point. Others think that we're very likely to pass it very soon and we don't see the drastic steps being taken that would prevent us from uh, passing it. And as you heard uh, Clive saying, there are scientists who think that we're heading for four degrees, and uh, I think Sarah mentioned uh, some speculating at six degrees, which is certainly way up into this dangerous zone. So we have got ourselves into a horrendous situation, and the consequences of this are likely to be disastrous for hundreds of millions or billions of human beings, and let me also say for billions of non-human animals as well that will be unable to adapt to uh, climate change and will die as a result. Their environment that they rely on to live in will, will simply disappear in the areas that they're in. So um, we have this situation. Now, I think there's complete agreement between Clive and myself, and I would imagine between really everyone in this room or um, virtually everyone, that the best thing we can do in this situation is to dramatically cut our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the problem is that it doesn't seem that this is likely to happen in time to uh, prevent this dangerous anthropogenic climate change, to prevent the kind of feedback loops cutting into effect Clive mentioned one of them, the uh, melting of Arctic ice, which uh, means the oceans absorb more heat, or the releasing of trapped methane in the permafrost of Siberia. Um, so uh, I can't actually see a scenario where we cut emissions within the time frame needed to prevent some of these things happening. Uh, it's not clear, as I say, whether we've already passed that tipping point or we'll pass it in 10 years or in 20 years, but we would need very drastic reductions. Uh, some people think, well, here in Australia we passed a carbon tax, so we're now doing our part. But uh, obviously we're not. That tax has not um, had a major impact as yet, uh, won't have a major impact for some time to come. Um, even if it did, it would relate to a limited amount of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and of course, Australia is, is one small nation, uh, even if a very high per capita emitter, in the other nations of the world. And it's not simply a matter even of the things that we talk about often, like uh, fossil fuels, moving to more efficient vehicles or electric vehicles. 
moving away from um, moving away from coal-fired power generation to uh, solar uh, stationary electricity generation. Um, even if we did all that, we still have the major problem of livestock emissions, um, which are also a major factor in contributing to climate change. Uh, it's been less publicised and it's not captured by things like the, the cap and trade schemes that uh, we have or the carbon taxes. But um, methane emissions from uh, ruminant animals, particularly from cattle and sheep, are responsible for a very substantial part of uh, Australia's emissions. Uh, you get different estimates, but it could be something like a third of our um, uh, overall carbon emissions. In fact, one study in the United, of the United States, uh, was published a year or two ago in World Watch, suggested that livestock was responsible for 51% of US emissions. And if it's hard to see the US actually doing anything about their fossil fuel emissions, you have to be wildly optimistic to think that they're going to be doing anything about their livestock emissions uh, within the next few years. Um, so uh, we have, a, I think, a real problem, and I don't think we have a foreseeable way of, of getting out of it. It would be nice if we did. Um, Naomi Klein had an article in the New York Times just a couple of months ago in which she said, basically, well, isn't it obvious, given the risks of geoengineering, isn't it obvious that it would be much better to reduce our carbon emissions? Of course it's obvious. That's not the argument. I don't think it's worth having that discussion because we all agree. The question is, given what's a reasonable prediction of where we're going to go, should we be doing research into geoengineering? That seems to me the, the question that we ought to be discussing. And notice that I said, I didn't say should we be engaged in geoengineering, I said we should be, do, should we be doing research into geoengineering. Because again, I don't think anybody, well almost, I'll make an exception to that in a moment, I don't think any of the serious scientists or policy makers are really saying we should be doing geoengineering now. I think there's general agreement that we don't know enough about it, that it would be ludicrously risky to start doing things with the knowledge we have. The exception that I'm thinking of is this uh, rogue scientist, Russ George, who um, got a boat, uh, went out um, into the, uh, into the um, northern Pacific, I think it was, if I remember rightly, uh, northwest Pacific, and dumped about 100 tonnes of iron filings into the ocean um, to sort of, uh, I think, you know, you could say that was research too, to see what effect it would have, although it was not good research. But, you know, anyway, I mean, to do something to see what was going to happen, and there were various speculations about what other motivations he might have uh, in terms of doing this. But um, most people think that that's, you know, not something that we're ready for. So the question really is, should we be doing research into this so that some years down the track, if, as can be reasonably predicted, we have not cut our emissions sufficiently, um, then we may know enough about geoengineering to be able to do something. And that seems to me to be a more reasonable proposition. Um, firstly, I should say that, again, it, uh, it depends on the forms that we're talking about. And as Clive mentioned and Sarah mentioned too, some forms of geoengineering we all agree with. We all agree with planting more trees to soak up carbon. Um, but that's a, a form of uh, geoengineering. I think uh, painting roofs white sounds good. And if we can find a way to take carbon out of the atmosphere, uh, which is, has a net carbon reduction. Obviously, there are ways right now we can take carbon out of the atmosphere, but they involve a lot of energy. And uh, given that uh, we, can't, we don't have surplus energy, um, and creating more energy typically creates using more fossil fuels, we're not taking out more carbon than we're putting into it. But there are scientists working on that. Um, and some scientists think that that is reasonably promising. Some scientists think it's not promising. Um, but again, I think if we could do that, if we had devices that would take carbon out of the atmosphere, 
store it somewhere safely underground, uh, that would be a reasonable thing to do. It's the um, solar radiation mechanisms that are the sorts of things that uh, Clive focused on and that are the things that we would need to think much more seriously about. Uh, the, uh, the sulfate uh, aerosols or a variety of other schemes that have been suggested. Pumping seawater into the atmosphere uh, at a high level is uh, another thing that's been suggested. Putting various kinds of screens to reflect back uh, sunlight um, uh, up in, into, into orbit, for example. Um, there's various kinds of schemes. And uh, I think it's clear that we simply don't know enough about their effects to say too much about it. Um, but are there reasons why we should not even be researching that? So if we hear, for example, that Bill Gates is the leading financier of uh, research into geoengineering, should we think, um, oh, there's something sinister about this? Uh, this is a, ba a bad thing that one person has the money to put many millions of dollars into this? Or should we think, well, this is an intelligent and far-sighted person who has put a vast amount of money into trying to reduce global disease, trying to help the poorest people in the world, um, has probably, according to one estimate I've seen, already through the Gates Foundation, saved 5.8 million children's lives, uh, of children under five who would have otherwise died from preventable diseases that efforts from the Gates Foundation have uh, uh, led to, um, and who therefore, you know, I think we can reasonably assume has uh, some altruistic uh, benevolent impulses, uh, and who is also thinking long term about the dangers to humanity from climate change and wants us to have the knowledge that if we have to take drastic and risky steps to forestall catastrophes, that um, he would, we would then be in a position to do so. Um, that seems to me to be a reasonable hypothesis. So uh, what are the arguments against doing this research? Why would people think we shouldn't? Well, as Clive said, some people think it will create this sort of moral hazard that we will think, oh, well, it's not too bad to go on using fossil fuels because we can always spray sulfates into the atmosphere and that'll fix the problem. I think it's, we've got to be absolutely clear that, that we cannot allow that argument to go unchallenged um, because even if we do develop things that would cool the planet, as uh, again, Clive accurately said, the, um, this doesn't fix the whole problem. This could have further consequences, uh, does not reduce the acidification of the oceans, which could mean to the deaths of the, deaths of the oceans with further consequences, could affect the um, Indian monsoon, although so of course would continued climate change. Um, so uh, it's, it's risky, it's definitely a last resort, it's not something we want to do, and we would still have to get uh, stop our, our carbon emissions. But um, even though it's true that some people may use this in order to argue for we don't need to do anything, um, I think the dangers of not doing something like this are too great to really uh, avoid um, doing research into this. The other thing, as well as researching the technical questions of can we do it, the other thing that we need to think about and uh, that should be discussed at forums like this, for example, is if we do develop some plan that might be on balance worth doing, given the other costs of doing nothing, then who is going to decide to do it? As we saw, uh, a rogue scientist went out and dumped 100 tonnes of, of iron into the ocean. Um, that's too small a scale to do anything, but um, what if Bill Gates decided that he wanted to do that? He no doubt could afford to put enough iron into the ocean or to spray sulfates into the atmosphere for that matter to make a difference. Or a single country could decide that it wanted to do that. Um, we don't have any kind of mechanism, we don't have any international law precedence really for deciding whether that would be wrong, whether that would be any kind of violation of, of international law, and how should we decide? Uh, the obvious body to make that decision would be the United Nations, but the United Nations is a fairly cumbersome body. It um, 
things tend to get decided through the Security Council, which has a veto system for the victors from World War II, a kind of historical veto system that doesn't necessarily have terrific relevance today. So I think we, we need to think about that issue as well on a political level. So I think it's, it's important to raise these issues. Um, it's important to think about them carefully. Uh, and it's important to, to reach decisions about them. Uh, wasn't clear, I think, from what, what Clive uh, said today, uh, what his views are. And as I said, when I saw the title of the book, I thought that suggests that he's opposed to this idea. But if you read the, the book, um, I think you can, you can tell us the moment, Clive, that it ends up um, perhaps more open-minded than that would suggest, uh, that this may be something that uh, we do need to do as a last resort. And uh, if that's so, then maybe we don't fundamentally disagree about um, the overall question, because I certainly would see this as, as something that we ought to use only as a last resort. But I do see it as now something that we should not shut the door to, that we should um, actually support the idea of research being done onto it, on it, while, of course, continuing to say what we really need to do is to cut all of our greenhouse gas emissions very drastically so that we never actually really have to use this dangerous last resort that we may be able to develop within the next decade or two. Thank you. Um, now we're going to have a, a little conversation between us and shortly we'll open up the, uh, f to the floor for questions. So I hope you're all thinking up some excellent questions. My first question is for you, Clive. Last November we read in the newspapers that the permafrost is melting, which may potentially release tonnes of methane, which is a greenhouse gas, um, out, out into the atmosphere, making global wor worse, global warming worse, etc., etc., etc. And so if geoengineering was only to be explored in a worst case scenario, would not the permafrost melting be that trigger? What, what's the trigger? What should we look for? Well, that's a very good question. And in fact, there's a group of scientists, uh, particularly in the UK, called the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, who are saying right now that uh, release of methane from the Arctic has, has almost crossed the point of no return that we should now be uh, injecting sulphate aerosols above the Arctic in order to uh, try to protect uh, the ice from melting further. Um, most other climate scientists, I think it's true to say, who are very concerned about this and involved in geoengineering, saying that it's too early to reach that kind of conclusion. And so um, they uh, regard the, that group as being a little bit like Russ George uh, and going out there too far too fast and, uh, creating, uh, and creating problems. Um, so um, certainly there may come a point quite soon where we believe that uh, release of methane from permafrost or indeed even more scarily from clathrates, that frozen me methane at the bottom of the Arctic uh, Ocean, for example, which is already starting to bubble up, uh, may be approach a point of no return. We should uh, intervene. But I want to make the point, Sarah, look, I mean, this is a really, really difficult question for environmentalists. There's no, it's, it, there's no easy answer to this. And there are some, some of the climate scientists who are engaged in geoengineering research uh, have a very strong track record of, 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 uh, of campaigning to persuade the world to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and have come into geoengineering research certainly with heavy hearts. It's not something they really feel good about, although some of them, I, you know, I fear have become overexcited about it. And that's why, and that's my concern, just returning to Peter's objection to the, to the uh, phrase playing God. I mean, Peter, it's a metaphor. You know, no one's suggesting we not are. Not everybody believes it's a metaphor. Well, no, but I think I do. And uh, most people who see the book's title say that's a metaphor. And it's a metaphor for the essential argument of the book, and that is to what extent should humans give free rein to their hubristic tendencies, to their Promethean urges, and to what extent should we constrain that and act in a more humble way, uh, particularly when we recognise we've uh, screwed up so badly by playing God and embarking on this process of transforming the planet in our own interests? 
So that's, uh, that's all it refers to, but I think it's absolutely the fundamental uh, question. What kind of attitudes should we adopt to it? And that's why, I'll just finish, I know this is a long-winded answer, but coming back to the Bill Gates question, yes. And th I mean, this is why it's a hard question. Bill Gates um, has devoted a huge amount of wealth for altruistic reasons for uh, the global good. No doubt about that. And there's no doubt, too, in my mind, that he's genuinely concerned about climate change and is investing in geoengineering because he believes the world will not respond in time and therefore we need a plan B. My point, however, is not um, uh, what his motivations are, but the kind of worldview Bill Gates and similar people bring to it, and that is a technological worldview, a Promethean worldview, where uh, we don't adopt a humble attitude to the natural world and recognise the gross errors that we've done and the possibility of making even more gross errors through our uh, implementation of grand technological solutions. But in fact, what we need is more technology. What we need is grander technological solutions. What we have to do is to counter our previous technological mistakes with much more um, godlike technological uh, contributions, seizing control of the planetary system in total. That's my concern. It's not the motivation of the money, but it's the kind of worldview that Bill Gates and other people bring to it. I'm going to come back to your Promethean view of us and our, our obsession with the techno fix. But first I'd like to ask Peter, you, you say that we should perhaps be researching this as a plan B or a plan C or possibly even a plan Z. But we know what the problem is. The problem is us and our fossil fuels, and we know how to fix that. Why should we spend all this time and energy researching a plan Z when we've got a perfectly good plan A sitting in front of us? Because we don't know how to fix it. And the only reason you can say we know how to fix it is because we is ambiguous in this sense. Um, scientists know that if we switched from fossil fuels to renew renewable solar energy, for example, that if we stopped, if we dramatically reduced the number of rumen and animals that we had, then the problem would be fixed. But we don't know how to achieve that. Neither you nor I nor any other policymaker knows how to get the Chinese and the Americans and the Indians and the Brazilians and the Australians. We can certainly add, thank you. We shouldn't, we shouldn't pat ourselves on the back too much. We've got lots of those cattle and sheep running around putting their emissions in and we're doing nothing about that. Um, so we don't know how to fix it. As a political problem, we don't know how to fix it. And, you know, that's, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's one of these situations where um, we need to have other options available. We should certainly still keep trying to fix it, do our best that we can. But we should recognise that at the moment we don't know how to bring about the results that we all want to bring about. So, Clive, I suspect that you've got a response to that because Eli Kintish wrote in his book Hack the Planet that to oppose geoengineering, one must accept one of two faulty propositions. Either the problem is not that serious or we're on our way to solving it. So you seem to indicate that perhaps geoengineering is not a path we should go down too hastily, so you must accept one of those propositions. Well, um, look, I think there's a real danger. I mean, people say, well, are you in favour of it or are you opposed to it? I think it's, I mean, I think it's, that's a simple-minded um, approach to geoengineering because we have to ask, well, what are we actually talking about? In what circumstances are we talking about geoengineering the planet? What are the atmospheric circumstances? What kind of emergency or otherwise do we face? Or should we just do it anyway because it's cheaper than uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Um, who will have their hand on the thermostat? Um, how will we decide to turn it up or down? Uh, what triggers would we use to say we've made a mistake? What if it's good for China and America, but a lot of people in Africa are dying? Uh, will the Africans have any say? So until you answer all of those questions, I don't think that you can make a judgment about the desirability of geoengineering. And so when Peter says we don't know how to fix it, you know, look, emissions from agriculture in Australia amount to mm, perhaps 15, maybe 20% of Australia's total greenhouse gas emissions. Now, they are certainly more difficult to control and reduce 
than the other 80%. But I don't know why our whole approach should be dominated by the diffi more, more difficult 20% when we know how to deal with the 80%. Uh, that's why Beyond Zero Emissions is here. Uh, and so, yes, we do know how to fix it, or we do know how to make huge reductions in our greenhouse gas emissions at relatively uh, modest cost. And so um, that, that's what we should be doing. And the danger, the fundamental danger of, of uh, researching and talking about and talking up geoengineering is that unlike Peter's characterization of we know where we're going, we ought to do research to prepare for it, doing research and preparing for it actually affects what we're going to do about mitigation. And that's why you have people in the United States like Newt Gingrich um, and uh, in Europe like Bjorn Lomborg and a range of right-wing think tanks who immediately seize on geoengineering as a way of um, getting out of our obligations uh, of absolving us from the moral responsibility in the West of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, which of course we know are damaging, most damaging to people in poor countries. So on that then, <laughs> there you go. So if you're looking at then potentially exploring it and, and you're suggesting that we should at least talk about the ethics of it first before we go potentially exploring it, but can the, the moral hazard, as you put it, of exploring um, geoengineering um, as, as a potential get out of jail free card, could it work in the reverse direction? Could the fact that we're now exploring it show that we are deadly serious about climate change and that we have reached a point where we're pretty much hitting the panic button on this? Um, sorry, if I can say, yeah, I mean, I, I think it could have that effect. And it's interesting, you know, you're talking about these right wing Americans who are taking it up. But right-wing Americans, the, the, the key ideology that they have is that they're opposed to big government. And geoengineering is going to be big government. It's not going to be individual scientists like Russ George or whatever um, going out and doing their own little thing. Um, it is going to be government that's doing it. So, you know, I mean, firstly, they have to, if they're really talking seriously about it, firstly, it means that they have to forget the idea of denying climate change, which is a relief. Um, and secondly, it means that they, they you know, really would have to overcome that huge opposition that they have to be government. I don't think that we will find the right united on support for geoengineering, even if it does allow big oil uh, interests and others to continue with what they're doing. I think that they would have a very heated debate among themselves before they actually go in that direction. Um, I'm sure you're right, Peter. Um, and you know, there are some uh, climate deniers who, of course, uh, take the consistent position that we should not talk about or research geoengineering because there's no problem to solve. But what is interesting is that some of the most prominent uh, opponents of climate change action, including those uh, promoting climate science disinformation, have suddenly come out in favour of solving a problem that they won't admit exists. And I think what this tells us is actually it's not climate science that, there's, there, that is their real enemy, it's environmentalists. I mean, there's, if there's one thing these people on the right hate more than big government, it's greenies. <laughs> and, and if uh, supporting some action like geoengineering, which involves big government, is a way of defeating environmentalists, then they are supported. I mean, truly. As uh, one of the leading um, members of the uh, of the so-called greenhouse mafia, the fossil fuel lobbyists in Australia famously said, um, the reason I get out of bed in the morning is to defeat the greenies. And, uh, and so I think that on the moral hazard argument you asked about, I mean, I've heard this argument put that, uh, as one German geoengineering scientist uh, put it, you know, he, he takes a view that doing research into geoengineering is like holding out the instruments of torture and saying, you know, you know, unless you do the right thing, uh, fess up to your greenhouse gas emissions and do something about it, you know, this is what you're going to get. And for some people, that may well work. You know, uh, I'm not sure that any people in this room need more incentives to start campaigning to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but if you did, probably the kind of geoengineering scheme that's been outlined is enough to do it. But let me finish on one point, one last point, and that is on this moral hazard question. Um, I think there's a very good parallel which I draw in the book between geoengineering and so-called clean coal. 
Uh, for 10 years, governments around the world, including ours, have been saying, look, we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and we can save the coal industry by developing these grand schemes of carbon capture and storage. We can burn fossil fuels, capture the carbon, pipe it somewhere and bury it underground forever. And what this has done is effectively helped delay action on climate change for a decade because those technologies are now starting to prove not feasible, enormously expensive, more risky than the proponents claim. And I suspect that that same process will happen with geoengineering. It'll be seen to be the get out of jail free card. Uh, and there'll be a lot of research and hope invested in it, but after 10 or 15 years, once people begun to begin, begin to realise the dangers, we're talking about the biggest schemes, not so much biochar growing trees, white roofs and so on, which in themselves are relatively benign but really won't solve the problem, um, we will, people will start to say, well, hang on, the great promise hasn't been realised and we've been continued to omit uh, at rapid rates for another 10 or 15 years, Crites, the problem's even worse. I'd like to bring you back to your discussion about the Promethean point. Um, as I said at the beginning, that humans are the only species on this planet who deliberately modify their own environment to suit themselves. It seems to be part of our nature that we're always looking for the technological fix. We just want to do some engineering and make the problem go away and we can get on with our comfortable lives. Wouldn't then trying to oppose our urge to find a techno fix to climate change be going simply against human nature? Well, uh, I mean, any discussion of human nature immediately <laughs> raises all sorts of problems. Of course, there are plenty of cultures and societies which haven't been seized uh, by that urge. And even today, if you compare the extraordinary emphasis on techno fixes in the United States with the kind of attitude in Northern Europe, you can see there's a very different uh, uh, set of approaches. In fact, in the book, well, uh, yeah, I, there are exceptions to the rule, but I have noticed in my dealings with climate scientists that there really is quite a marked contrast between the attitudes of geoengineering researchers in Europe and those in the United States. And those in the United States are um, um, although I stress there are exceptions, uh, they're much more prone to think, well, if we've got the technology to take control of the Earth's climate system, then why wouldn't we? Whereas people in Europe are much more inclined to say, if we've got the technology to take control of the Earth's climate system, then we're probably going to make a terrible mistake, so we should be extremely cautious. So obvious, it's obvious to everyone that my sympathies are, are much more European uh, than they are American, although I should say that there are plenty of people in America who share these kinds of uh, anxieties and that's why we're seeing uh, the start of a, of a campaign, if you like, to, um, to try to temper the dreams uh, or to pour cold water on the plans of those who are more enthusiastic about geoengineering. I read a, a fable about geoengineering, which was that there was a village um, and there was farmers around the village and villages within the village. The farmers preferred it when it rained and the um, people who lived in the village preferred it when it was sunny. What they had was a rope hanging out of the sky and they all came to an agreement that the farmers had a turn to pull it and it would rain and then you'd pull it again and then the sun would come out and you'd pull it again and it would start raining. So the, the villagers and the farmers came to an agreement about who would pull the rope and when. However, as is likely to happen, inevitably f arguments broke out over who got to pull the rope and when they got to pull it. If we are able to develop geoengineering and, and the ability to turn the weather off and on at will, what does this mean for global security, Peter? Well, this really means that we are one world in a sense which we haven't been before, although we've definitely been heading in that direction, we've known that, um, but it means that we have to have a process for deciding this if, if we were to do this. And as I say, I mean, I don't think we have anything like the ability to do this at this stage, and I'm not suggesting we should. But I do think we need to start thinking about, if it were to come to that, what would be a fair and reasonable mechanism for deciding how we do that. And, and that's certainly a major problem with, with the whole idea, that we, we need to have that. Because I think that you know, the problems are, as with climate change, they're both scientific and political, as I've been saying. In a scientific sense, we know what we need to do to prevent climate change. In a political sense, we don't. 
Um, you know, and I'll just sort of just comment on what Clive said a, a few moments earlier that say we know what to do in Australia. Actually, we don't. I mean, in the sense, one sense, we, yes, we know we should all vote for the Greens and then we would have a Green government and they would have the policies to do this seriously. But, but we know that in September the 14th, that is not going to happen. And it's not going to happen in the next election after that either. You know, maybe things will get bad eventually, people will realise, and they will elect a Green government. But um, it you know, would be a very bold prediction to say that's going to happen in time to, for Australia to reduce its emissions to what it needs to do. And if it's not going to happen in Australia, you can be doubly sure it's not going to happen in the United States. So um, I think those, those are the questions, the political questions are really the difficult ones. Um, and with geoengineering, we certainly should not focus only on the scientific questions. We should focus on the political ones as well. I'd like to keep you going with that one, which is that we've been told that uh, the world's poor are the people who will suffer most from the effects of climate change simply because they don't have the money to rebuild their infrastructure or move it in preparation. It would then be logical to assume that the people who would benefit most from the world from geoengineering would be the world's poor because those effects wouldn't necessarily come to pass. So do the rich countries of the world owe it to the poor countries of the world to research and deploy geoengineering? Well, I think that's, that's a reasonable argument given the present situation. Of course, you could say they only owe that because of their dire moral failure to do anything about their emissions. Um, a dire moral failure that, as I said, at a minimum goes back to 1992 to the Earth Summit when they promised that they would do something about it and didn't, but you know, arguably goes back a couple of decades before that. But, but yeah, there has been that terrible moral failure. And now there is the question of what can you do um, to compensate the people who are already suffering, some are already suffering from, from this failure, and much larger numbers who will be suffering in future decades, um, who, as you say, are mostly, uh, mostly the poor, um, or overwhelmingly uh, those who are very poor. So uh, I think you could say that um, given that the rich nations have done this, given that we may already be locked into catastrophic consequences for the poor, the rich nations do owe it to try to see what they could do to minimise that. Now, there are many other things that they can do as well, of course, in terms of helping them, the poor to adapt, um, uh, taking climate refugees when the time comes, although it will be very interesting to see whether the rich nations do that. You'd have to be pretty optimistic to think that they will. Um, uh, but this could be one other option that you could say they, they have a responsibility to reduce the harm that they have already caused. Could I just comment? I mean, that raises the question, of course, is on what basis would we imagine that rich countries in possession of geoengineering technology <clears throat> would deploy it in a <clears throat> morally responsible, benevolent way in the interests of the poorest when the very reason that geoengineering technologies have arisen is because rich countries don't care? about the impact of climate change on the poor. Why do we think geoengineering would be deployed with any greater uh, benevolence than uh, the approach of rich countries to mitigating their own greenhouse gas emissions? What we're much more likely to see is exactly the same <clears throat> moral failure that has infested uh, uh, international negotiations would in fact underpin the deployment and the use of geoengineering. And that's why in practice, uh, many developing countries are increasingly anxious about research uh, on, on, in geoengineering and why in, a, in very early stages they're starting to organise at a number of uh, international forums, uh, most notably the Convention on Biodiversity, where an alliance of more progressive wealthy nations, particularly in Northern Europe, but predominantly uh, uh, nations from Africa and South America, uh, are putting forward resolutions, which indeed have been adopted, uh, imposing restrictions on even research into geoengineering because they fear uh, that this technology would, would be another means by which uh, rich countries would conspire against the interests of the poor. But, but is that really realistic? I mean, you know, maybe know more about the science than I do, but I would have thought that most of the geoengineering solutions that would help the rich nations, that would, for example, 
stop sea levels rising and inundating parts of the United States as they did when Hurricane Sandy struck last year would also be beneficial to the poor people of Bangladesh. I mean, I don't know of any scheme that would allow sea levels to continue to rise in Bangladesh while stopping them rising along the coast of the United States. Um, you can imagine local schemes that would prevent them entering New York Harbour, perhaps, but, um, uh, or Venice, you know, that sort of thing. But, but you know, that's not what we're talking about. If you want to stop sea levels rising, you're going to stop them rising everywhere, and that's going to benefit people in low-lying farmlands in the Bangladesh Delta uh, just as much, or actually more, since they, those people have fewer options, then it's going to benefit people trying to protect real estate values in their coastal homes in New York and New Jersey. Well, one of the <clears throat> robust results to emerge from the early model-based studies of sulphate aerosol spraying, the preeminent uh, proposal for geoengineering, is that although uh, uh, it would have a fairly even impact on reducing warming about the globe, it would have a differential impact on precipitation around the, uh, around the globe. And uh, in particular, there's concern that uh, global warming counteracted by sulphate aerosol spraying uh, would uh, have a whole range of different impacts on, on uh, rainfall around the world, including, as I mentioned in my talk, the possibility of the shifting of the Indian monsoon, basically to the southwest, so it would move from over India, Pakistan, down across perhaps more towards um, uh, northern Africa. And so you can immediately see uh, that uh, geoengineering has the potential to create enormous international conflict. And there are even people, uh, it's very early days, but they're doing it nevertheless. The security establishment, and of course, the military and security people are starting to take a strong interest in geoengineering, because in the end, if it comes to sulfate aerosol spraying, it will be the military that, uh, that controls it. Uh, but they're starting to work out scenarios where there might be wars uh, over climate engineering. Uh, through the deployment of technologies. You might, for example, um, if you have a nation that feels it's been severely damaged by the impacts of uh, geoengineering, one scheme or another, might, for instance, uh, uh, go up and shoot down the planes. Um, or they might deploy a counter geoengineering technology. Now, the strategic planners, I mean, it's very early days, but they're already starting to entertain these kinds of possibilities, and they arise because of the differential impact of geoengineering, along with, of course, the differential impact of climate change itself. Can I ask one quick follow-up? I mean, yes, I've heard that sulphate aerosols might change the Indian monsoon, but isn't it true that climate change itself, without any aerosols, is also going to change the Indian monsoon? It may well, but here's a crucial point. Um, climate change, I mean, nobody is, is, deliberate, is burning fuels fossil fuels deliberately to change the climate. It's kind of a, an, an accidental result, albeit one we're conscious of and could take actions against. On the other hand, if you're deploying sulphate aerosol spraying on marine cloud brightening uh, or ocean iron fertilisation specifically and deliberately to transform the climate, albeit with a benevolent aim, and if it goes wrong, or if you are benefiting much more than another country, then you've got a deliberate act uh, which is harming someone else, uh, and therefore the legal uh, responsibility is much more clear. And that's why, amongst many others, there are quite a number of international lawyers who are entering into the geoengineering debate and asking what kind of implications um, uh, geoengineering would have for international law and what kind of international law would bear on any deployment. And this is partly because there is actually, at the moment, no international law that would prevent uh, Bill Gates or Russ George or Richard Branson or China uh, deploying uh, sulphate aerosol spraying in order to uh, take control of the world's climate. There is no legal instrument internationally that could prevent that. I'm going to ask one more question of Peter and then I'm going to open it up to the floor for questions. And just a reminder, if you are going to ask a question, wait for someone to rush over with a microphone. My last question for Peter is, um, uh, say through some miraculous agreement the world agreed we would undertake geoengineering. Do we humans, and we're just one species on this planet, have the right to decide what happens to the climate of the entire planet? Yes, 
We do because there just isn't anyone else who can do it. Um, you know, sure, if we could involve non-human animals in the discussions, um, then it would be wrong for humans to take that decision without involving them. Uh, but um, you know, I think it's 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 in a way I, the, the phrasing of the question about having a right just seems to me to be a misleading and irrelevant phrasing because um, you know what are, what are the options here? What we're looking to do is to do. Let's assume that we are altruistic. Let's assume that we are actually making a decision for the benefit of all humans and all sentient beings on the planet. Um, then it uh, seems to me obvious that that's something that we ought to be doing. That the other option is just to allow, again, this phrase, to allow nature to take its course. And if nature taking its course will mean billions of sentient beings dying miserably, whereas we could prevent that, then it seems to me obvious that we should prevent it. All right. We'll open this up for questions from the floor, and there are lots. So, yep, we've got one right here right now. Um, my question is to Peter Singer. Um, I understand that you're a vegan, your diet is vegan. I'm not sure if that's correct. But, um, you're sort of touching on the methane issue as affecting this whole um, issue. And I was wondering why the whole vegan diet thing isn't uh, given more emphasis so that we can sort of um, not perpetuate these industries of suffering and also maybe uh, start to practice non-harm as a, as a lifestyle so that we can extend that to greater things and maybe, maybe not want to have cars individually because I don't see governments or institutions coming with solutions. It has to be individually, I, I think. So I'm just wondering if you could uh, address that a little bit. Yeah. Um, I think the reason that we're not seeing more discussion of that is because there are few people who actually follow that practice themselves. Um, and let me say I'm mostly vegan, but I'm not actually totally strict about it um, in all respects. Um, but I do think that that's the best diet to follow. Um, but if you look at the opinion makers, the politicians, the scientists, even, even the leaders of environmental organisations, they're often not only not vegan, but not even vegetarian. Um, I've seen a welcome shift in the right direction in the last few years. That's a good thing. And if that happens, we'll probably get more people talking about it. But um, I, don't, I think the reason that it's not so much you know, front and centre in the agenda as for something like uh, fossil fuels is, is because um, people don't really want to confront it themselves in their own lives. We had a question over on this side. Um, question, I guess, to, to Clive and to Peter. But um, uh, one of the things I've noticed of, of late is that people are beginning to be more and more pessimistic about the potential to actually solve the climate problem. And that's really difficult. If you're trying to mount a campaign to get people to go for zero emissions and do the drawdown of excess carbon dioxide and so on, if they're feeling despondent that there's nothing that can be you know, that we cannot produce the results, then in fact you can derail the very campaigns that, that, that you're talking about. The, the problem I see is that if we do everything we need to do that's on the top of our list, so the first thing is zero emission economy absolutely at, at emergency speed, let's do it in 10 years. If we did that, how much would the temperature fall, fall, not, I mean it stops the rising, but how much would the temperature fall once we've implemented globally a zero emissions economy? The answer is not very much at all for thousands of years. So then we put in place the second thing we absolutely must do, which is to draw down the carbon dioxide to take the excess out of the air so that we can return to a natural, safe climate. But the question is that that's constrained by um, food production. You can't turn the whole of, of agriculture into a drawdown system. You can't turn the whole of um, biodiversity into a drawdown system. So there's a constraint on how fast you can take the CO2 out of the air. So you're left with this dilemma, which we've probably got decades, several decades, in which the Earth is going to be absolutely humongously too hot while we're doing absolutely everything we must do. And so, so the question is, what do we, as people who do care and who will be campaigning for what should be done because we care, what do we do to deal with that problem? Yeah, and uh, it's... Um 
the correct way of characterising it, I think. Um, but, you know, one thing that we can't do any longer is tell lies to people. And that is by saying, look, if we act, we can solve this problem and make it go away. It's too late for that. We've got a problem. Uh, it's going to be with us for a very long time. Uh, I don't think anyone seriously thinks we can limit warming to two degrees. Um, we'll be lucky if we can, very lucky if we can limit it to three. And when you've got the World Bank uh, warning that we're on track to four, then you know we've got a serious problem. So, I mean, one of the reasons why I wrote an earlier book, Requiem for a Species, is to try to counter the kind of false hope uh, that I think uh, some people have been continuing to give that if only we, you know, get our act together soon, then we can make this problem go away. And because of that, um, you're quite right in saying that even if we do get really serious about it and reduce greenhouse gas emissions at, you know, the rapidest rate that seems politically feasible, we'd still be left with this problem. And so therefore, would we not be better uh, or do we not, in addition, need to engage in some kind of uh, carbon dioxide drawdown uh, process taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And uh, on the face of it, yes, uh, there's a sort of compelling case for that. But then you have to start confronting, well, how do we do that and what are the implications of it? And uh, whilst it certainly should be pursued in uh, all of its ways, and there are some ways that are much more b benign, actually the task of doing it is far more difficult than we can imagine. I'll just illustrate very briefly with this point. If you think about the Earth and where the carbon atoms are, um, you'll find a lot of it in the atmosphere, you'll find quite a bit of it in the vegetation, uh, there's a lot in the rocks which are effectively stuck there, um, there's a lot of it in the ocean, particularly the deep ocean, and there's a lot of it in highly concentrated, stable form under the ground in the form of fossil fuels. And what we've been doing for 200 years is digging it up, burning it, and putting a huge amount of carbon atoms into the atmosphere and to some degree into the biosphere and the oceans as well. Now, when it's in the biosphere, it doesn't, those carbon atoms are not stabilised there, as you know. Um, they, the vegetation dies, it burns, it rots, etc. So what we have to do is to find somewhere to store this huge amount of carbon that we've dug out from under the ground where it was safely stored for millions of years. We've released it into the mobile parts of the earth and we have to find a place uh, to store it safely for thousands and thousands of years. And that's not going to be in the vegetation because there's just not enough of it. What's next, he asks. Well, the, I mean, the other alternatives are to trying to get it into the deep ocean. Uh, which in a way is, uh, is most appealing, but uh, fraught with difficulties, as I tried to illustrate, or to store it back underground in the form of carbon capture and storage. And... Uh, what about well, biochar? What about biochar? Well, if you look at the estimates of the... Bio, there's nothing wrong with biochar. It's just that it's, uh, as, a, as a solution to... As a drawdown solution, it can only be a tiny response to a massive problem. The independent estimates are, are that biochar can only play a small role in getting uh, substantial amounts of carbon, carbon out of the atmosphere. We'll move on because there's lots of questioners and we've got a uh, gentleman in a red t-shirt. Peter, you raised the question of the politics of it. Shouldn't we therefore be advocating for a sort of form of eco-fascism as the appropriate way to make the tough decisions? Good question because we haven't been able to make the tough decisions with democracy. So, I mean, as uh, was said about, about democracy, it's, it's, the worst of, it's the worst political system you can have except for all the others. Um, and I think we're sort of, you know, the, the question is, would you really get a better political system? I, I think we're actually getting an interesting global test of this because, um, you know, the, the world's two lead, leading emitters um, are one which has prided itself on being the greatest democracy on earth, the United States, and the other which has no pretensions to be a democracy, but does have um, an elite government which is authoritarian and which has the ability to get its will done, more or less, um, throughout a very large country. Um, and they are showing now signs of being serious about climate change and of doing things about it. So it would be interesting if China decides that they are going to get serious about cutting their emissions and uh, democracy in the United States is really unable to reach the point that they do something about it. It would be, I, I guess you could say, that 
the first sort of major new anti-democratic argument that has been around for a long time. Um, I'd be extremely reluctant to accept that as, as a conclusion because we do see the tendency of authoritarian regimes to corruption and to serving their own interests rather than serving the, the larger interests. That's a very strong lesson when you look at the history of authoritarian regimes. Uh, so, you know, hard to know, but if you get to an absolute crisis, I could see why somebody could think that that might be the way to go. We have time for only one last quick question, unfortunately. Uh, white singlet there. Um, my question's for Peter Singer. Um, it seems like Clive Hamilton's um, conception of what satisfactory research is, is we can't do satisfactory research into geo um, engineering without implementation. We just won't know. Whereas your conception seems to be we can do the research and then we'll decide to implement. So what do you say to Clive? Um, seems like Clive Hamilton would say, even if we've, we do the research, it's not satisfactory at that point of implementation. So can we, um, do you just have different conceptions of what the research, what is satisfactory research? Maybe we have different connections of the will of the political system to recognise the results of the research and to reach a rational decision on that basis. Because what I see as happening is we do the research, we realise all along that this is a last resort. Now the research might show actually that this is not going to work or is going to be catastrophically risky and then we would not do it if the research shows that it's actually worse than, than not doing it. But of course the research might show that it is better than not doing it, even though it's risky, and then we might reach a decision to implement it. I take it that, that Clive's view is a little more cynical and is saying, well, we do the research and then people say, oh yeah, it's risky, but this is better than having to stop using fossil fuels and disrupt the American way of life and all the rest of it, so let's go ahead and do it even while we're not taking serious steps about carbon. Uh, and that, you know, I recognise that that's a possibility. Uh, I'm not naive about human nature. But I just think that uh, while that's a possibility, there is also a possibility that we could do the research while continuing to be serious about reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions and only use it if we really are in that emergency where it is clearly better than the option of not using it. But I just want to finish on, on this point uh, that uh, the point I was making, Peter, and I think the question I was asking is that no amount of research will tell us, uh, will give us any confidence that it will work because, own, because you can't experiment with this. You can't do a little patch of sky and see what will happen to the world's uh, climate system. You have to implement it and then wait at least 10 years before you know whether it's going to work. And the, and the danger is that there will be a sort of envelope of uncertainty where you have a bunch of people with an interest or a technological worldview that will tend to override the kinds of risks that are involved and want to implement that kind of geoengineering anyway. I'll just finish on one last point, which is the democracy question. I mean, like Peter, I think the answer is a reinvigoration of democracy. I think that's the only response. But there is this very interesting point that Peter raises that China potentially uh, seems to be far more serious about reducing greenhouse gas emissions than the United States. And I think that might well translate over into geoengineering deployment as well, because you can see a situation in China where the central government is under massive social pressure because of climatic disasters around the country, um, um, under enormous pressure to do something about it. Uh, whereas in the US there'd be so much protest from people about sulfate aerosol spraying, for example, that any US government would feel it couldn't do it. But you could easily see the US administration giving a sort of quiet nod and a wink to China to say, you go ahead and do it, we can't. Um, and uh, you know, we won't do anything about it except make some kind of formal protest, but really we support it. I think that's the most likely scenario, and it's one um, that uh, you know, makes me a little bit more concerned when we see that China is now staying, starting the process of uh, researching geoengineering, because they're scared too. This has been 
absolutely fascinating, and I could sit here and listen to this all day. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. This event is part of the Sustainability in the Edge program made possible by the support of Australian Ethical Super. We also thank the festival's principal partners, the Department of Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, the City of Melbourne, and like to acknowledge the festival's major partners, including Melbourne Water, Mobile Master, Air Design, Complete Colour, and associate partners, Tech Collect, RMIT University, Forte Living, and Landcare Victoria. Our wonderful speakers will be sticking around for a little bit to sign books if you would like to purchase one of their wonderful tomes. Um, thank you very much, everyone. This has been a splendid afternoon.